Can you believe that? Wow, that looks like I'm looking at like Korean World Cup 2002. <laughs> 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 That verse is saying to me that, that God is good all the time. That God is good no matter what is going in your life, no matter what happens from this point on, that whatever you endure, whatever storm that you take, whatever storm that brings your way, that our mouths are always saying that God is good all the time. And that, that's what we always say, right? We always say, God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Okay, one more time. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. That's, that's the thing that you got to keep saying over and over and over. And when you hear my testimony, I, this is what I want you to constantly remind yourself. Constantly play that in your mind. God is good all the time. Okay, that's what I want you to think, be thinking. God is good all the time. When we say all the time, it means not during the happy times. But it means during the worst of times. Every single moment of your time. God is good all the time. I want you to think about that. Lord Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity for me to just to come up and just give my give my testimony. And Lord, I've, I know I've said my testimony many, many times, Lord Father, but I know that every time I'm able to share it, that I know there's somebody here that gets touched and blessed. And I pray that you will just once again use the Holy Spirit to touch all of us and for us to learn and to know. But truly, yes, Lord. But no matter what happens, no matter what goes on, or no matter what's going to come in our future, Lord, you are good. You are good all the time. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, you know, for me to start my testimony, I always got to start off with my parents, okay? Uh, starting off with my parents is the first one. Is like My dad, you know, when growing up, used to tell me, like, he was in the Vietnam War, okay? He was in the White Horse. Anybody know White Horse? Peng Ma. Peng Ma. Peng Ma Did I say it right? Peng Ma Tuk-tung-je, whatever. Alright, so here's the white horse. They, they say it was similar to like the Navy SEALs or Green Beret like, of America, right? He was pretty like, but I was like, oh, cool, man, man, you're a white horse, man. I was like, but what did you do? He said, I was a translator. <laughs> I was like, that's messed up, yo. I thought you were going to kill the people. <laughs> but then he would tell these stories where, like, he, he, he you know, Vietnam War was a crazy place to have war. And he was telling that he would sleep with his buddy and his partner, and they, they couldn't sleep like just laying down. They had to be back to back and with their helmets on because they always had to be ready. And they said the jungle was so filled, like, like you didn't know which way or who were, were coming. And he was saying that it would be raining all the time. And he said that like when they hear like, let's go, let's go, you're like, let's go, and then his friend would be dead, you know, like shot. And he's like, he's seen so many horror stories. And he was telling me a story where he was in a truck, like transported to another city. And he was at the end of the truck, and he was saying that he was so sleepy that he took his helmet off, and he's like, oh, I gotta sleep a little bit, right? My dad didn't sleep anywhere. You know, he's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta sleep. And then he was sleeping, and it's one of those trucks where they carry the armies, right? So they were driving, and then all of a sudden the truck hit a bump, and my dad flew off the truck, right? And he fell down, and then my dad said that right when he fell off the truck, a bomb came and hit that truck and killed everyone in there, all right? That's what he told me. I'm like, Dad, thank God that you're alive. <laughs> Right, because he goes on the album here, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Think, 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 okay? <laughs> so I was like, oh man, that's a crazy story, right? I said, like, man, God was with him, right? And my mom, you know, growing up, I was telling my mom, and my, 
my mom is, was, the, was the six children, right, out of 12. She was like right in the middle. But the thing is, six children above her all died, right? So my grandma was telling me this story. My grandma was telling me, yeah, your mother was six. When she was, when she was born, and she had trouble that one day, like one night, my mom just stopped reading, right? My how many, so like, you know, my how many went through so many death with the children? And, and so total right now that there are six living, but there are six that passed away, right? So she's used to all this, right? And back then, I don't know, they had a lot of babies, okay? So like, when my mom was born, she stopped reading. My how many said, oh, chon then. <laughs> like, just like, I was like, really said that? Like, oh, just chon so, no? I was like, oh, what you said? No. <laughs> like, she, she went through something. thing. She said that she was going to bury her next morning. And then, when she woke up the next morning, my mom was breathing. And Muhammad said, oh, it's hot on me. No joke. And then, so like, my mom, like, she, 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 she had some complications, like, growing up. She, had, she was really weak. And because of her, uh, like, she actually, like, survived the whole like, disease and all these different things. And, and she, she, she was to carry a baby. And she would pray. And my mom was a god, my mom was a godly mother. And she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she said, Lord, give me a child, give me a child. And she went to acupuncture, and you know, all the, the hanyak, and inside, and all the things you can think of that your mom trying to feed you. Like, I don't want that stuff in you. But she ate to drink all that. And, and finally, finally, she got pregnant. Finally. And when she got pregnant, it's, it was me, okay? <laughs> I, I beat out the millions and millions of other people trying to be born. <laughs> I, I made it. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's the first time I got clapped. I'm a winner. <laughs> so, that's why, that's why I'm the only child. I'm the only child. After me, she could not have another <laughs> children. She couldn't, she couldn't have another. So I grew up being the only child. Now, you know, my mom's friends will always say, like, oh, you know, I know you had a hard time and having a children and all your your I think now so don't you know? Like you just have to do it, man. <laughs> you know, like so they always say, you got a big son, you know. And so like, you know, ever ever since their stories, I'm thinking to myself, like, when I think about my life now, I look at it and say, Man, God had a plan. And that's what I'm saying. You, you might not know right now, but God does have a plan for you. He has a plan for you. He wants to use you. You know, if God can use someone like me, He can use you definitely. And here's the thing: this. So, growing up, I was born. A lot of people ask me, "Where you born? Were you born? Were you born in like, you know?" I, I, that's the funny thing. A lot of people think that I'm, I'm not Korean. And I got, I get people like, "Hawaiian?" Oh, right? <laughs> I got Hawaiian, like, guy, and you know, a lot of people think that uh, that I'm like, I got, I get really, I get a lot of Chinese and Mongolian. I get a lot of, I got a lot of Jap, like, not a lot of Japanese. And for some odd reason. Like a couple times, they think I'm Latino. <laughs> Do you see, I don't know. Why the fuck did you know? Oh my goodness. Right? This is, I don't even understand. But so, so but I, I was born in California. I was born in California. Maybe that's where I, you know, I'm, that's why I get my out, outgoing you know, nature. I, I love the West Coast. I, I lived there for about a couple years, and then I moved to Dallas, Texas, and that's where I started to get inbred by the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> right. I lived in Texas for about nine years. And then, here's the thing, I remember growing up, like it was a hard life because like I told you like in my previous sermons that there weren't a lot of Asians. So, growing up, I always were, or I always got into trouble because I always was fighting in school. My mom always had to come pick me up because, you know, you know, why she always why do you fight all the time? I said, Mom, these kids think that I'm different. They think that I look different. Don't you see I got blonde hair and blue eyes like just like them? You know? I really thought that I was an American guy, man. <laughs> I thought I had the big clothes and just like, oh that's I'm like American. And every time they like they make fun of me, I'm like, what's wrong with you, man? I'm not like you bro. <laughs> like, no, you don't, why not? And, but then, then, you know, and all the jokes and everything, like. I just, uh, like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like, in trouble. But, uh, so, like, I just couldn't understand that. But then, about, about when I was 11 years old, my dad decided to uh, 
move the whole family. My dad come in and say, hey, son, moving, dad's going to start a business, we're moving to Korea. And here's the thing, I've been living my whole life in Texas, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, I'm like, I have friends, you know, I'm like 11 years old, I'm like, man, where's Korea, man, where's this place, Korea? So like, I was like, looking through the map, and then, I like, I couldn't find it. <laughs> like, three hours, like, finding it. And then I come across and I see Korea. I'm like, oh. And I'm just staring at it. And I'm like, oh my gosh. The more I stare at it. You know, some people think that I look like a bunny. I'm looking at it like, oh my gosh. It's like a McDonald's chicken nugget. <laughs> I'll show you. So, oh, yeah, but, but they must be producing some nuggets. <laughs> and I was, oh, I was like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And my parents were like, yeah, we gotta go. And I remember packing up and then I remember moving to Korea. Oh, yeah, man. When I got off of Korea, when I stepped out of the plane, I had a culture shock. When I came off the plane, my mind's like, finally, everybody looks like me. <laughs> I was like, everybody smells like me. I was like, oh my goodness, where is this place? I couldn't speak Korean that well. You know, and I was just like, oh my, where, where am I? You know? And I remember, you know, like, you, you know, Korean people call me and they call me father, like, fresh off the boat. I remember my friends calling me, yo, you bug, man, you bug. What's that, man? You back on boat. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I'm like, oh. all of my friends are like, crazy, man. You know, so like, I, I'm so I, you know, I, I, I enter a, a Christian school, right? Like I said, I've been to church all my life. I went to church. My, my mom took me to church, I grew up in the church. But, like I told you in my previous sermon, I didn't, I didn't, I got, I accepted Christ when I was in sixth grade. I, I went into the Christian schools and, and for the first time, when the teacher, as a Christian school, the teacher was talking about the gospel, talking about how Jesus came and he died on the cross and he was nailed there and, and that he rose again on the third day so that he can, he, he can give me the freedom of my sin and, and break the bondage of sin for me and give me everlasting life. And that how he came and you know he didn't have to and that God loved us so much. We hear it all the time over and over. And I remember just listening to it and, and towards this, like towards the beginning, like mid the middle of the semester, I'm just like, man, this message is something I never heard. And, you know, yeah, I heard it all about in Sunday school, but you know, every time I just pray, I always pray for things like for myself, like God, give me this, give me that. But I never really had this relationship. I never really understood until that until that teacher began to tell me about the love of Jesus Christ. And I remember, just like how maybe some of you felt the other day, the Holy Spirit just knocking at my door saying, David, you need this. You need this salvation. You need Jesus in your heart. And I'm just fighting with my all my fleshly desires. Like, no man, I can't do this. And I remember the teacher always saying, you know, the teacher says, all right. If you want to receive Jesus Christ, come up here to the altar. And everybody's heads down, you know, like we always do. And I remember just sitting there, like, should I go? Should I go? Should I go? And my and the Holy Spirit, they push me. Go, go, go. And then the teacher's like, you know, one last call. If you want to come up and accept Jesus Christ? Come on. I'm like, oh. But I didn't go. Right? <laughs> I didn't go. So I didn't go. But I went home. But I went home that night. And then all, when I was sleeping on my bed, and I was laying there, I, just, I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning. I was like, what is this feeling? What is this thing that's, like, that's making me go crazy? And I was like, oh, Lord, if you are true, if you, if you are what you say you are, then I need you. And I knelt down on my knees, and I accepted Christ as my Savior at sixth grade. And I got told you, I remember when he came in, it's that love that, that you can't explain. It's like the tears of just joy, like, Lord, like the burden just came off me. I'm like, oh, Lord, you're God. Oh, my goodness, Jesus, you're awesome. I love you so much. And I just remember just like, oh, just, oh, I just want to tell everybody about Jesus. I want to tell everybody. And I told you that when I came out, my mom was like, the way that, you know. I said, mom, I accepted Jesus Christ. And mom was like, oh, hallelujah. We had this like, little get together right there, worshiping together right there at that moment. And it was beautiful. And I, and I remember going the next day, and I remember, and I got, you know, met a couple of friends of mine, and then we just started this group called the AC Group. AC Group, right? And the AC Group stands for Accountability Group. Man, that group was like, that, like so basically everything I told you up to this point, the sermons that I told you, is something that I want you to understand. We got together, and this AC Group, this Accountability Group, what we do is, as soon as we sin, 
we get together and say, bro, I did this. And we pray together and we start crying together and we start pouring ourselves together and just re uh, repenting together. You know, back then we couldn't text. Yeah, there's no such thing as texting. I say, oh, bro, this no, we, I had to wait the next day. If I sinned, I'm like, oh, Lord. And I ask forgiveness for the Lord. I say, oh, I, gotta, I can't wait till the next day. And I see my friends. I'm so, so ecstatic. Like, oh, brother, this is what happened. And this, so we formed this AC crew group, uh, accountability crew. And we had this slogan, right? We had this, we made up our own slogan. We were cool, man. We had this thing called, shaking the gates of hell. Oh, that's awesome, right? What does that mean? Well, that meant that we wanted to go down to hell and shake the gates and say, ha, 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 you're losing and we're winning. <laughs> that's, how, that's how pumped up we were. And I told you that we just grabbed people and threw them in the bathroom and said, get saved. <laughs> we, were, we were crazy. We were, cheap. we were just so excited. And I remember eighth grade came along and ninth grade, eighth grade just ended. And I remember my friends were like, yo, because they're military kids. They're like, yo, we gotta move back to the States. And they're two, they're two of my best friends. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I remember they're saying, hey, man, when, when we leave, don't lose the fire. You know, you stay strong. You keep the fort down. I said, bro, don't worry, man. I got, I got this, man. I got it. So they left. And I remember that whole summer, I'm just praying, reading. And I remember ninth grade comes along. High school, right? And it's a small Christian school, not a lot of kids, but still, it's, it was high school and I walked in and I'm, 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 I'm telling them, I'm like, these new students, they come in, I'm like, yo man, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. I'm like, yo man, get off me, man. And it was a different response. It was a totally different, different response. And the more and more I tried to preach about the gospel, the more and more I felt like I was being rejected. And it didn't come to me until the end of, like, in, in about the middle of ninth grade. I was walking to my locker and I heard these Friends of mine that I thought were my friends talking behind my back. And they were saying, yo, man, man we're going to pick this party. You want to go? Yeah, man, that sounds pretty fun. And he goes, hey, but what do you do? Don't tell David. Because if he finds out, he's going to mess things up. Just keep it a secret. When I heard that, it crushed me. It crushed me. I remember going home that night. Tears in my eyes, alone, <laughs> feel like I was a baby, no friends, loser, reject, you name it, that's what I felt. And I did, and I said that, I said, God, what kind of God are you? What kind of God that says that you love me would do such a thing? I had that attitude. And I basically turned my back on God. I said, forget you. And by the time I was at, by the time the end of ninth grade year, I was hanging with the wrong crowd. And when you're in Korea, when you're in Korea, you, everything else is so accessible. You can get, you can get drinks, you can get alcohol easily. I felt, I felt with the wrong crowd. By the time, like, end of my ninth grade year, I was coming to school drunk. I was coming to school like hangovers. I wasn't studying at all. I basically threw out everything. I just did everything that you could think of. I started doing. I started rebelling totally. My dad wasn't around. He was at, in the States, you know, doing business. Because the business he's trying to start a career didn't work, so he moved. So it was just me and my mother. My mother was still a devout Christian, going to church every day. And I wasn't, you know, my mom wasn't around because she was always busy with church. And I felt like neglected by her too because she was always with church. And that began to tell me, like, oh man, my mom thinks God is more important than me. And then, so basically, I was to start living with my friends. And this all I did was drink, party, smoke. If you can think of a little black book of sin, I basically did everything that you can imagine, except for one thing, or well, a couple things, like I didn't kill anybody. Right? <laughs> right? That's good. But the other thing is, I never did drugs either, like hardcore drugs. Right? I remember my friend, like, doing drugs and and like he would, he would like have this thing called acid and he would pop in his mouth and what it does it makes you hallucinate and the reason why I never did it is because one day we were in Seoul and we are walking, Seoul is like, like millions of people right? walking, you, you, you literally have to bump each other and I remember he was like, yo, but you want one? I was like, no man, I don't mess with that stuff and he popped one in his mouth like, no joke, like 10 minutes later he was like, <gasps> right around the middle of Seoul, like, what are you doing? He was like, yo man, I'm surfing man, it's going crazy, <laughs> yeah, just 
starts yelling, and, and all of a sudden he starts to tumble on the ground and fall, and everybody's like, oh, and I was so embarrassed, and I was like, yo, man, thank God I never did that, man, because I, I don't know what would be happening <laughs> If I put that in, I'm like, man, it's getting hot in here, man. That would be pretty bad. That would be a bad sight. <laughs> so, so I never messed with that, but here's the thing, though. If you, young kids, no joke. Like, don't even come near it. Don't even think about it. Don't even try it. That dude, that my friend of mine, got so messed up that, like, he doesn't even remember his name sometimes. He don't even remember his name. And he's, he's so messed up in the brain, you know? So, drugs is not, no, don't, never do, don't do drugs, right? Don't do any of these things that you think is cool or popular or whatever. So, but, so basically, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, senior year, that's all I did was, I, I hardly had any study, I didn't do any, any uh, I didn't, you know, everything I did in high school was just like, basically, I didn't do it on my own. I was a bully, I became a bully, I made kids do my homework, and I, you know, cheated my way through the whole high school. And, and the school that I went to was always a school that wasn't like the best educated school either. A Christian school, it was kind of small. And, and the reason why I did it was I had this one class in senior that was Hanmun. Right? And, and so, you know, the, the, like, Hanmun is a Chinese character. And I remember, like, the night before, I would get this, I would make a little cheat sheet. Okay? And I, I remember, like, during the class, I would just cheat on my thing. And, my Korean teacher was pretty cool. Like she was like, you know, like hey, yeah, just whatever, whatever. The thing is, everybody in that class was getting A. And I remember my principal saying, coming in through the final, and saying, "Yo, I don't believe everybody here is getting A, except for you, David." He called me out there. Thinking, I don't believe you're getting A. And I was sitting way in the back, right? He's like, "You got to come to the front." I was like, "Oh man!" But I remember pulling my stuff out and going to the front, and just like sitting there. He goes, "Whatever you get on this grade is what you get the grade for the entire year." I was like, yo, that's my ass, man, that's messed up. And I was just sitting there, and he said, like, I'm not going to leave the class either until you guys are finished. And I was like, oh, man, so I was just doodling on my paper, you know? And I was like, oh, my goodness. And then I remember, like, no joke, like 15 minutes before class was about to be over, secretary runs up and says, like, Principal Jimmy, you got an urgent phone call, you got to come down. He's like, what, I need to go? I was like, yeah, this is so urgent. And I remember, like, he was terminated. He was like, yo, I'll be back. <laughs> he didn't keep me back. Oh my goodness, when he left, I pulled out that cheat sheet, like, oh, oh. <laughs> when, when you do a hum, it's so hard, you know, you're just basically drawing, and I'm doing this, and all of a sudden, like, I get this tap on my shoulder, because I totally forgot that the Korean teacher was still there, and I'm like, and the teacher, like, tapped me on my shoulder, I looked up, and she was like, oh. and I was like, oh. and, I and then I remember, like, I'll never forget the words, she was just like, she said, <laughs> Like, what in the world? Like, 
The only thing, only difference was math and English was switched. <laughs> So I'm like basically said, man, okay, I'm not going to college, no college is going to accept me. Uh, I said, but you know what, I didn't care, I really didn't care. And what happened was, Lord and behold, like, I put my applications in and, you know, obviously I didn't hear anything. But there's one school that did, I hear back from, and that was Liberty University. <laughs> uh, anybody in Liberty University? Yes, yes. Uh, did, you still, did you know? You know? Uh, I'm from Rome. Oh, you're from Rome? Okay, okay. Uh, Liberty University, right? Thank God for Liberty University. It's a Christian school, right? The only reason why they accepted me is because they wanted my money. <laughs> I, I, I know they did because they, for my SAT scores, they, they accepted me anyways. So I was like, okay, I'm going to Liberty University. And I said to myself, when I go to college, my parents were like, they were so excited. Like, you know, my parents at first wanted me to go to good college, like Harvard or all these great colleges. But when I told Liberty, they're like, my mom was like, oh, what, what kind of school? I was like, Christian school. And she said, oh, hey, China, China. And then my dad was like, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, come on, dad. My dad's a trick, man. Like, I'm sure, like, all of you guys know, like, my dad would never say anything. You know, he, he, there's, like, subtle things that he'll say that you know that he's angry. Like, my dad used to say, just, you know, like, when I'm fighting with my mom, like, oh, yeah, you know, because I used to do that a lot in high school. I used to fight with my mom all the time. If you went to my room in high school, there'd be holes everywhere because I was so angry at my mother. Uh, and then my dad would come back. My dad came back after a couple years later after business didn't work out. He moved back to Korea. And why we were living, you know, I didn't have a relationship with my dad. And, but I always knew that when my dad was angry, like my mom and I would fight. You know, my dad in the living room would be like, <clears throat> when he says that, man, like, oh, man, he just hung up. <laughs> you know, I can't mess with my dad, you know? And I remember in high school, like, I remember, I remember going to college and then like, coming back and then I remember I had this coolest haircut, the like, H.O.T. haircut. <laughs> like, you remember that? I don't know, maybe some of you, my, my bang, my, my underneath here was all shaved, right? It had bangs all the way down to right here. And so when you tie it up right here, and then you have everything shaved, it's like tied right like Samurai, you know? I thought it was the coolest thing, man. I was like, this is so cool. And I remember coming, to, coming home from college and my mom was like, don't be good at that. What kind of hairstyle is that? And I was like, I can't tell you to the moms. I can't tell you to that. And I remember uh, going to a, uh, eating a dinner, and my dad looked at my haircut and was like, John Lua. So I go in there, right? So, you see, being, being rebellious, you know, you don't want to listen to your parents. So I shaved everything off, except for two long bangs. <laughs> I had two long bangs that come to my chin. Right, so I was like, oh, this is cool, you know, like, shaving like this. And I remember going in, into the dining room and thinking that I paid my dad, you know. And I, you know, I just took showers, and I slipped it back. And I remember just drinking, and it was like, mm -hmm. and then the bangs came down. <laughs> and my dad, I love. And then I I go back to the bathroom, and I take the scissors, and I snip it off. I had like two little horns. My dad's a trip. But so like so I go to Liberty University and then oh I got a letter in the, in the mail saying, 
saying that you are on probation <laughs> if you break the law. Right? But here's the thing, I didn't care. I didn't really care. I didn't care how uneducated I was. I just started to, I started, I just really enjoyed the party. Though. I just, I really loved it. I loved just, you know, getting wasted and, and not caring and just living life carelessly. And that, this is how it began. Like, freshman year, sophomore year. And then when junior year came, that's when God had to leave. The reason why I always tell you something about that, you know, I make these little silly illustrations like this, 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 this. No matter how much I was living on that, God was still in my life. No matter how much I messed up, God never left me. Because He always does things to try to draw me back to Him. And I remember in junior year, that's when I met my wife. My wife was a really godly woman. And she would be saying, like, you know, you want to date me, you better stop drinking, you better stop smoking. I said, you got a sister. Because <laughs> 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 she was hot, hot, hotness. <laughs> 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 uh, but seriously, I was like, okay. And then that's, that's, that's one of the reasons I told you. I stopped drinking, just like that. I stopped drinking. But I couldn't really <coughs> quit smoking. And I still couldn't quit the partying atmosphere. And I remember it was time for me to graduate, you know, senior year in college, and I have managed from a point zero seven GPA with numerous of probation letters uh, to finally get to two point zero GPA. Uh, I barely, like my senior year, I barely graduated. I barely graduated. And I remember though, like Getting like getting that, that that you know graduation, you graduated, and I'm like, oh wow, I can't believe I'm gonna have to graduate with the amount of work that I put into it. And I remember telling my mom and my grandmother, they're coming from Korea, they're like, they're so excited. My mom was like, I said, my mom is like, God, and she's like, oh thank you. You know, I can't believe you're graduating, I'm so excited for you. And, uh, you know, oh man, and you know, my dad was like, mm, yeah. <laughs> 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 he's not really happy. And my mom's like, I'll be there. And I remember, so we went and uh, graduation was May, I was going on May 7th, 1997, on a Saturday. That Friday, that Friday morning, my mom came from Korea. So this was Lynchburg, about three and a half hours from Dulles Airport. I drove all the way, I mean from there, from Lynchburg, I drove up to Dulles Airport. And I picked up my mom and my grandmother from Korea. <laughs> And Thursday night, before I went to pick them up, Thursday night, I was at a party. And I was just smoking and at a party scene, and my wife, my wife didn't know where I was. And I was just kind of just sitting there, and I had this little, like, what do you call it? Epiphany? Epif or anything, whatever. Yeah. You see, you can tell that I'm not very, I have a very hard time with vocabulary words. Some of you, like, I guess, like, I say, like, Philemion. It's hard for me to read sometimes. Because that's how that's how bad like uneducated like I was because I basically didn't study at all. I mean, like it was terrible how much I didn't study. And I tell that's why you know I tell my kids, I tell everybody, you, know, you gotta study, you gotta study really, you know. That's your that's your responsibility. That is your will right now as students. You got to study. So that Thursday night I remember just smoking a cigarette and I remember sitting there and all my friends are partying and I'm like, man. I had this thing, I was like, you know what? For some reason, I feel like God is going to punish me. I just had that feeling that like God is going to punish me. But the thing is, you know, back then I think it was punished, but, you know, as we heard, like Pastor Jacob said, you know, I don't think God punishes, He disciplines those that He loves. Just like any parent would do. Any parent would discipline their child if they're going the wrong way. But for me, at that moment, I was like, God's going to punish me. God's going to punish me. And that Friday, I went to pick up my mother and my grandmother, and, and as we were coming down, 29, I was kind of late for a rehearsal. I was going about 85 miles per hour on, on 55. And I remember driving, it's in two lanes, like, like cars this way, you know, coming this way, and I remember driving. And I remember just looking and just feeling like a little guilty, because my mom's so happy, but I really did put my effort into it. 
And I remember just looking in the rear view mirror, and my mother's just smiling. She's always smiling. Like, you know, so, oh, she's so proud of her son. And I remember my grandmother was sleeping, and, and my wife, you know, well, my, my girlfriend back then, she was sitting next to me, and they were both sleeping. And I remember just looking at my mother and saying, oh, you know, I got to do better. I got to do better. And at that, that split moment when I was thinking that, right in front of me, I see a car coming right at me. The car, there's a car that was turning into a lane like this. And I immediately when I looked at that car, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going 85 miles per hour. If I don't do anything right now, I'm going to hit red. I'm going to go face first right through that car. So what I did was I cut my wheel so fast. I was like, it's like one of the, it's like, everything's like a second. I was like, oh, and I cut my wheel. Then I remember going with my car going that way. And I remember all the cars coming this way. I said, I cut my wheel this way. By that time, my car was spinning. And all of a sudden, I just, just boom. And then everything blacked out. I don't know what happened after that. And I remember just, just, I remember the only thing that, after that blackout, I remember somebody elbowed me in my ribs. And I, I get up, and I open my eyes. And what happens, my car is like landing on the side. And I'm on top of my wife, and she's, She's wearing a seatbelt, and she's, she's holding me, and she's jabbing me because she can't breathe. <laughs> right? She's jabbing me because she can't breathe, right? So I'm like, oh, and I get up, and I'm, I'm maneuvering myself, and then, here's the thing. If there's anything that is horrifying, it's when I turned around, <coughs> and I saw my mother and my grandmother thrown out of the car. <coughs> Their bodies was buried beneath the car. And I, I remember just looking at their feet. And I was like, where are their bodies? And I remember like, looking around. And I remember trying to open the door. And, and it's jammed. I can't get out. And I remember like, what's going on here? And the only thing that was opening was that little back, little, little back window of the car. And I remember just going and busting that window. And I remember coming out. I remember running out to the, to the side, the front of the car. And I remember, here's the car in here. And I see their body, like, inside. And I see my grandmother on top of my mother. And I remember just looking at this. Everything's like a dream. I'm just like, oh, my Oh, my get to the hell. Oh, my There's no breathing at all. Everything is lifeless. And I'm just sitting there like, what's going on? What's happening? And by that time, it's amazing how fast, like, paramedics came. Like, while I'm just thinking this, where blood is gushing out of my face, <laughs> ambulance came, police came, and I remember they're just pushing me to the side, and I remember just, well, I'm just watching everything, what's going on, and I remember them pulling off my grandmother, and flipping her over, and I remember her face visual, and her tongue sticking out, her face is blue, and I remember with the paramedics, hey, we need the helicopter, get it here fast, and then I remember that they pulled her to the side, and I remember when they pulled my mother out of the car, it was still lifeless, and I remember when they, when they turned her over, the, I couldn't recognize her face because it was all bloody. And I remember the sigh, I remember the burden that just lifted up when I heard her go, when she breathed, I was like, oh, I was like, oh, thank you, oh my goodness. I said, oh my get you there. And I remember my mom, when she had that breath, when she breathed, and there was, and she, I mean, she, she's not concentrated, she just like messed up, and she said, this is what her, this is what she was saying, she's like, Comes up, ah, that's my Korean. Comes up, the Kentana. I said, that Kentana, Kentana. And she goes, Unana. That's my wife's name. Unana, Kentana, Kentana, Kentana. Hi, my name. Hi, my name. And I was like, I couldn't say anything. I said, how many more you saw? And the thing, the, the very next thing that my mom said, the very next thing that my mom said, made me so angry. At that moment, my mom said. God, you are good. God, you are good. I'm like, what? What did you just say? She's like, I'm like, I can't tell. 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 I can't I'm just thinking to myself, how in the world can you be thanking God at this moment? How in the world can you be thanking a God that allowed this to happen? And then by that time, they pulled my mother out and they, they strapped her and they put her in the ambulance and they took me and then, you know, they, they, this is so stupid. I just got to, I got some blood on my face and they're like, this procedure, you need to be strapped out on the bed. 
Is it those eggs? How do they scrap them? They're going to eat you into the Bible. What the? They put this big neck thing on my neck. I couldn't breathe. I'm like, yo, I just got to cut my face. <laughs> You're going to suffocate me. <laughs> I'm going to die going to the hospital. <laughs> right? And I'm like sitting there like, oh my goodness. And I get to the hospital and I remember sitting in the emergency room all by myself. All by myself. <clears throat> and I remember the doctor walking in and he came and he's checking out my scar, he's checking out my cut, and he's like, you know what, you need to get stitches. And he began to proceed and say, you know, this is the thing that's going to happen, this is what you have to kind of calm yourself down. He says, your mother, she needs a couple plastic surgeries. Her ear got cut off in half, her chin to her, her mouth and her chin was split open that you could see her teeth. There were seven or eight places on her head were cut open because she's the one that broke through the window. And then that she just needs a couple of surgeries on her head, but she'd be okay. And she and he goes, but your grandmother. We examined her. Her being 77 years old, she broke all her ribs. She broke her shoulder bone, and one of the ribs is puncturing her lungs. She can't breathe on her own. I'm sorry, she's going to die. And he walked out. And I remember sitting there. Alone. Alone again. And I remember just putting my head down. You know, just wiping my tears, not knowing what's going on. My wife, but do, 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 actually the doctor said that my wife had no scratches at all. And she walked out crystal clean. You know, she was the only one wearing a seatbelt. You know, I, was, I wasn't even wearing a seatbelt. The, the last thing I remember is holding onto that steering wheel. Right? But my wife was that seatbelt, she had no scratch whatsoever. And she's waiting at, she's waiting outside. I remember just putting my head down, thinking, oh my. And I'm just replaying everything in my life, all the things. But the one thing that stuck in my mind that I can't get over was my mom saying, God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you deserve all my praises, no matter what. God, you're good. And I began to say that, God, you're good. God, you're good all the time. I began to say, God, you're amazing. God, you're good. And I began to just start to cry. I said, God, I'm sorry for the way that I've been living. I'm sorry for just living the life that I chose to do. I'm sorry that I, was, I didn't put my full trust in you. I'm sorry that I didn't obey you the full as I could. I said, Lord, I want to rededicate my life. I want to rededicate my life. You know, I could have easily said, curse you, God, again. But instead, I said, Lord, I want to give my life back to you. And I remember praying that I was like, Lord, if it is all possible, make my grandmother live. <coughs> and even if you does not live, Lord, if you just help us do this, I'll do anything that you call me to do. I'll do anything you call me to do. And I remember the doctor's walking back in and was like, it's like a like, movie. Like, I'll, that, I, as soon as I pray that prayer, the doctors walked in and they were going to stitch my, he was going to stitch my, my uh, a cut. And he was like, oh man. So, like, oh, you don't need stitches. You just, you know, put the stuff together. And then healed by itself. I was like, really? He said, yeah. And I had this little scar right here. Right? It's very faint. You can see it. It's like a Harry Potter mark. <laughs> right? So I'm like, this is the thing. I think God healed him. So that every time I look in the mirror, I can remember that promise that he made with me, that I made with him that day. So when doctors told me my grandma was going to die, you know, my mother prayed for my grandmother's salvation for 20 years straight, without a day missing for her salvation. And then to put that on top of me, the doctor said that she was going to die. Now here I am thinking that I killed my grandma and she's going to hell because of me. And I just continued to pray, and I continued to pray, and I remember after two and a half months, after two and a half months, when doctors said that she was going to die, when, when my family members came from Korea to pay their last respect, you know, how, you know what kind of, kind of looks I got from my uncles and my aunts? It wasn't pretty. They were, they were, they, I mean, no matter how much they loved me, you know, they're, they're thinking they're, they're paying their mother their last time, and, and the only person that 
did this, it was me. And I don't know how to react. My uncles and my emo looked at me. Yeah, they said, can't turn on, can't turn on. But I saw their faces, they were really angry about the carelessness that I, that I did. And after two and a half months of praying, and really praying, and really rededicating my life, guess what? <coughs> my grandma lived. When the doctor said that she was going to die, my grandma lived. Not only did my grandmother live, she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. The thing about my grandmother was that she was a Buddha, a shamanist. Like every time she heard the name of Jesus, she was like, get out of my house, I don't want that name. And she was that type of person that, that hated Jesus, that hated church. That's all Vichy. She all, like she believed superstition. Everything was superstition. She had all these little stickers above her rooms. You know, some, I don't know, some of you have maybe had the stickers and, and all these, uh, what do you call them, idols and different things like that. That type of person, for 77 years of living that way, accepted Christ as her personal Savior. And let me tell you, after that, after she accepted Christ as her Savior, she lived 10 years more after that. And let me tell you, it did, there was not a day that went by that she did not get up early in the morning, read her Bible, and prayed and thank God. And she almost died too. And she thanked God. And she said, God, you are good all the time. So I'm like, oh, wow, God, you are good all the time. God, you are good no matter what. You, you, you allowed my grandmother to live. You allowed my mother to, to, to survive this. And I thought to myself, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do now? So I, I prayed that prayer. You know, the thing is, you got to be careful when you pray because if you pray, God might answer you. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do? And I, and I went to church that day. And I went out to church. I'm just sitting there praying, saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? I had a professor at Liberty. After a service, he came up to me and said, you know, I've been praying. You know what? I think that you should be a pastor. You should go to seminary. I said, what? I said, what? I said, what? <laughs> seminary. What's seminary? He said, that's where you learn the Bible and do all these different things. And so you say, go back to school? Yeah, go back to school. And I didn't tell him what my GPA was. I was like, yeah, you're going to go to a master's degree. And, and I was like, oh my goodness, go back to school? <laughs> you know, the, the, the guy that's, you know, a hard time to study, the one that got 0.7 GPA in very fast college. I said, Lord, if you want me to go to seminary, you're the one who has to accept me and make me get into maybe make me get into graduate school. And I applied and Liberty accepted me again. <laughs> but here's the thing. <laughs> I went to Liberty for a graduate school. And guess what? I finished not with just one master, not with two, but three masters right now. And the thing is I did everything on my own. I didn't cheat. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't like uh, oh, procrastinate. I really busted my butt. I remember the first day, like I go back to class, and I'm like opening my book. I'm like, oh, the egg is <laughs> like so hard to read, so hard to memorize. But listen, I ended up graduating with a 3.2 GPA. Now I'm telling you, it's not by my strength. It is not by my strength. It is by his strength. His strength. When I rededicated my life to him, he began to show me where I needed to do. And when you follow the things that he wants you to do, everything falls in place. Everything falls in place. Yes, everything falls in place, but there will be some bumps and bruises on the way. There might be some tests here and there to make you get stronger, to make you get wiser. But whatever path that you're taking through that road, that rocky road, whatever, know for a fact that you must stay faithful and must continue with your lips saying, God, you are good all the time. Because that's not the end of my story. After I get to seminary, after I enrolled, 1997, I enrolled in seminary in 19... Uh, actually, in 2000, took a three-year off, 
And then Regiment got into, accepted into Liberty in the year 2000. Got married with my wife. And things were going great. And then our first child, my wife was pregnant. After about four months of pregnancy, my first child died. You know, in fact, Adelaide to go, I consider it to be my second and third. Because the first one actually died in the womb. Now, as a man, I don't know the feeling of what it means. But my wife had a tremendous hard time at that moment. She was really depressed. She was sick. She was hurt. Because when you have a baby, it's, it's part of you. And it died inside her stomach. She had to get surgically removed it. And it was a very, very uh, pressing time at that moment. And then, that was four months into our marriage. And then, four months after that, four months after our first child died, I get a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning from Korea. And I pick up the phone and I said, whenever, whenever you receive a phone call at 3 o'clock a.m. And I said, hello? And I remember my mom saying, how's it going? I said, wait, 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 what happened? And my, my initial thought was, how many dogs are And they said, Ali?
I'm so strong because I, you know, I have a close relation with my mother. It seems like every Asian person I know is close with their mothers. But not with their dads. Young men who are here, you need to take the initiative to say, Dad, I love you. Let's go do something. You need to call your dads every once in a while from college and say, Dad, I love you. What's so hard of saying, I love you from your mouth to your dad? No matter what they've done, they, they, we're all sinners. They're, your dad's a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. We make mistakes. They may have made mistakes in your lives. But there's no reason for you not to say, Dad, I love you. I tell my kids every single night, every single night before we go to bed, I tell them how much I love them. Because I don't want them to make the mistake of not hearing their father say, I love them. I hug them and I say, I love them. You know, this beard is not just there for looks. It's there to communicate with my kids. Arr, you know. No, I take this stop. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> but I want them to know how much I love them. And how much I'm proud of them. Listen, life is short. Life is short. You know, the one thing that I always wanted was my dad to hold my son, my daughter. I wanted my son, I wanted my dad to see to be able to throw the football and catch it together. I wanted my dad to see my daughter play the piano. But he's not here. He's not here. So I began to proceed my way to Korea. And I remember having to go into the morgue and I had to identify the body. What happened was my dad was hiking in the mountains early in the morning. And then when he got to the top of the mountain, he was hot and he took his shirt off or his jacket off. And the cold immediately came to his body and that's when he began to have a heart attack. And the crazy thing about the story is that while he was hunching and as he was trying to, like, I guess, breathe at this moment, there was this woman that was walking up this mountain on the same trail as my dad saw my dad hunching over, thought that he was drunk, and just walked by. 30 minutes later, that same woman came back down, saw people huddled around my dad, digging through his pockets, looking for money. And how do I know this? Because that woman is the one who called the cops. That woman happened to be a semi-called nurse. They could have easily stopped, and possibly, possibly <coughs> save my dad. But she passed on. Now, I don't blame her. I don't blame her. Because I, I believe that if it's, if it's your time to go, it's your time to go. God's calling you home. It's time for you to go home. And I have to believe it was my dad's time to go home. And I'm glad that he's a Christian. I know that he was a Christian. And right now, my dad is in heaven. And the cool thing about this thing is that what gives me comfort is that my dad is in heaven right now holding my firstborn child. You know how much I wanted my dad to see my firstborn child? The grief that I went through the whole year? I have peace knowing that my dad is holding my firstborn child out there in heaven. And I had to go through this. I had to go through this in this deal. I don't know why. But all I can say is that I'm still so thankful to my God. I still can say with my mouth that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Because in James chapter 1 verse 12, it says, Look, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Believe me when I say this, I feel like I'm a blessed man. I do. When I look at my life, a lot of things happen in my life. I really truly believe I'm blessed. I thank God for it. I'm blessed because I have a hot wife. 
I'm blessed because I have two healthy children. I'm blessed because I have a, I have a church that I can serve. I'm blessed because I have members that we can all love together. But I'm most thankful because I'm able to be used by God as an instrument. That my pains, my experiences can be a blessing to somebody that is sitting here right now. That I'm hoping that you don't have to go through those things because I went through it so that I can help those that might need to hear that to might get blessed. It might do some things. It might change our ways. It might get right with God. It might, it, might, it might start saying, I love you to your parents. You know, the parents, parents are just, you have to understand them. Their form of communication is so different from ours. You know, they're, they're one point generation. When they're growing up, you got to understand that they, they didn't have a lot of food growing up. So when your mom's always like, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. I'm a boy, I'm a I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. What they're saying is, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's what they're saying, I love you. I want to take care of your needs. It's not simply saying that just to eat. That's their form of saying, I'm loving to you. What your parents say to you, don't think it's always a nagging. Don't always think your parents are like, chants you. Your parents are not chancery. They're saying it out of love. Because what they're doing is the things that they did not have, the things that they could have made better, the things that they could have done things better, they don't want you to make the same mistakes. So there's their the formal way of chancery. Hey man, I'm 40 years old, my mom still chancery to me. <laughs> You'll never get away from it. You're always going to be a child to live. As long as you live. As long as they live. You're going to be a child to live. Right? But next time your parents are child to live, just run up there and hug them. One more time. When you get up, when you get home from retreat, run to your dad's, man. Men, run to your dad's. Just say, I want you to hug him. Just hug him. Your dad's going to say, I'm going to hug him. They're gonna say that to the white one. And just say, Kuruta, I'm just hard again. They're gonna say, I'm just hard again. They're gonna say, I'm just hard again. They're gonna say, I'm just hard again. Yeah. At least he says hard again, right? You gotta do that. Can we all say it together? God is good. All the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. God is good. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Let's pray.